Blues, um, you know, musical uh, journey is very similar. He's sort of the rock and roll that I always felt like Miles Davis is to jazz, as far as more than like half a dozen times for what he does has basically changed the direction of rock and roll and the way it's come after. I mean, can't deny the influence of the Velvet Underground or Transformer, which was recognized in its day, and then other things from Berlin to Street Hassle, Metal Machine Music, just what that influenced. So uh, Berlin is one that has been recognized as such in its, in its time. And uh, it's uh, just an amazing thing to be able to realize that and put it on stage uh, in the full way it was originally done with choir, strings, horns, the original music producer and director was there. Um, We're talking 1973. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, so uh, the reviews, uh, you know them better than me, but it, worst album ever made. <laughs> Most depressing album ever made. And it's, uh, you know, especially you said the ones that you've always followed, the commercial successes you've had with one that, uh, well, such as they are. <laughs> I think there's really only two, three. Wild Side, uh, followed by Berlin. Rocket, followed by Berlin, of course. Opportunity of a lifetime to fuck it up. <laughs> and then uh, Rock and Roll Animal, right? That was to undo the damage of Berlin. Berlin was used in a lawsuit against me by management to show why I shouldn't handle my own affairs because I would make an album like that. <laughs> the people who are interested in guidance from the music industry and the wisdom that comes with it. And then later I had an album called New York and that had like a little baby success called Dirty Boulevard. And I followed that with something complicated and fucked it up again. And here we is. The album about cancer. Oh, Magic and Loss about my friend Doc Pomus and um, uh, his death, and I had thought, there's no uh, contemporary music of the kind I'm interested in that deals with the problem of what happens when a friend dies, thematically. So I wrote this thing called Magic and Loss. And it's out of print, naturally. And, but periodically, walking down the street, people come over and say, you know, that album was really helpful. And it's always during the same, you know, kind of situation. There's some strange, if you could play another musical instrument, what would it be and why? Two instruments. One, I always wanted to play saxophone. And I wanted to play saxophone because I'm in love with Lee Allen. All my life, I have wanted to do every sax play I ever worked with. I said, "Can you do a Lee Allen solo?" Except Please. Ornette. Except I didn't do it with Ornette. That's true. <laughs> I absolutely did not do that with Ornette. No. But uh, every other sax player yes, you said, "Would you mind that tone?" And so I always wanted to do, to learn, see if it's possible to get that Lee Allen tone pretty hard to do, and just one solo. That, the other thing I like is a thing, I think it's the most extraordinary instrument I've ever seen, it's the Mini Moog Voyager. And I can sit, I'm not a keyboard player, but I can sit and play that for hours. I've done things about meditation music using that, it's an analog synth, I mean, it makes, you know, imagine God showed up and said, I will give you 9,000 new sounds. <laughs> That's my idea of heaven. A bank, nine banks, a 
2,000 songs or something, whatever it is. I have to have a, a young person with me to explain how to even turn it on. <laughs> but having said that, the thing I've got going for me is instinct. I can feel it. I try not to think. Thinking won't get me where I want to go. It'll just show me, you know, where the store is, where it's sold. But then instinct makes the music. Uh, has the way you write songs changed over time? No. And that's, that's because I've never understood how they get written. And I know people always want to know how you write a song. I don't know. I wanted to know too. And if I could have done it, I would have had Son of Wild Side. And I know I, I own an island in the Caribbean or something. <laughs> but I don't know how to do that. And I don't know how it works. And I don't know even why it works or what it has to do with anything. Um, I studied writing. I studied directing. I studied acting and film. I like all those things. But I wasn't a good enough actor. And now I have photo books, but I wasn't good at film. And then I started writing monologues for myself with music. That became a song. And I was, you know, I was reading Beckett. And I thought, oh, Ponzo, I don't know, that'd be fun if we have two characters over here. Drum, you know, and I like rock, so why not put the two together? Like, really simple, it's such a simple idea, I don't even know, I don't know if it qualifies as an idea. But that hadn't really existed. I thought eventually there was a thing, punk rock, punk soul, and it was people who couldn't play R&B. They hadn't grown up in the South, Austin, listening to all those great guitar players every minute of the day. They grew up in the city or wherever, and it, but they didn't have that, but they were rock people very pure, and that's the kind of music I wanted to make with the Velvet Underground. So we, we had a little fine system, no R&B licks, no blues guitar licks, because you can't play them. Let all these other guys go out who are trying to play that. And then the real guys who actually can play, we're gonna do this other kind of thing. This is gonna be city, pure. And so some of the bands we were seeing last night were like that, and I said, you know, punk the way I mean it, I don't mean punk in the old days, they meant a coward. I meant punk, aggressive, steel, street, action. That's what I meant. And there they were, uh, these bands last night. <laughs> All that young guy stuff, that's punk. Nobody can beat that. And now it exists, and it will forever, because where else are they going to put it? <laughs> it's there in jail. Excuse me. Yes, no. No, sorry. I was so sorry. Well, no, no, that's fine. 